Let's get it going, and here's uh, Mr. Grifter. All right. I like to pace a lot, so I need a lot of cord. Um, hi. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give something away at the end of this talk, um, and I don't have really a good way of doing it other than I have a pen up here and some paper where if you guys have, what's that? No. No, it counts against you. Uh, <laughs> um, but if you want to write down your handle or some unique identifier or whatever and then just leave it on the table, I promise you will want it. But yeah, sure, if that works. It's, actually, it's not a valid form of ID according to the card itself, but, you know, I'll, I'll, let, it, I'll let it pass. You know, so, yeah, if you want to do that, or you can just run up and, and do it while I'm talking. It won't distract me any more than anything else that my severe ADHD does. All right. Let's see if this works. Oh, magic. So, um, so who the hell am I? So, um, so I'm Neil Weiler, also known or better known in this community as Grifter. Um, by day, I do threat hunting and incident response for RSA. So that's uh, that's cool. That pays the bills. I like food, um, but I also uh, have been highly involved in the community, uh, pretty much in one form or another, almost my entire life. So. Uh, when I say that, I mean that um, I was one of the people that we now defend our networks against, and then you know an industry grew up around us, and 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 now people pay us to do the things that we were already good at, which is kind of awesome. Um, so I have been a DefCon goon for 17 years. Um, it's quite a while. I I know I'm I'm old. I'm officially old. Um, and then I also run all of the on-site technical operations for the Black Hat security briefing. So I've been doing that for 15 years as well. So um, I'll tell you how that, that came about a little bit too. This whole talk is basically going to be like stories with old man grifter. So just like, I'll try to keep it weird. Um, I'm also part of the DEF CON CFP review board. So all of the talks that get submitted to DEF CON, um, all of them. Um, I read through as well as 20 plus other folks to decide what actually makes it to the main stage. Um, and I'm also part of the Black Hat CFP review board. So the talks that show up at Black Hat, I read all of those as well. In that area, I focus more on um, the malware side, DFIR, um, network defense, that kind of, those, those tracks. Um, as well as this year, we have a new track. It's called Applied Security. Uh, and so I review those ones as well. Um, let's see. I'm also on the Black Hat Training Review Board, so all the training classes. I review those and then read all their stuff and then say, like, yes, this looks like something people would want to go to. Um, I am the founder of DC801, so the DEF CON group out in Utah, but not only the founder of DC801, the founder of DEF CON groups. So initially, I, um, I used to run the meetings in, in 2600 Salt Lake City, 2600 SLC. It's actually a pretty decent group. Um, I grew up in New York uh, on Long Island, so the Manhattan 2600 meeting obviously had some, some decent attendance. Um, and when I eventually started going to 2600 meetings out in Utah, they're just like, I showed up in the food court of the ZCMI mall, um, and there were seven of us, you know, and I was, like, I walked past, and it was near a payphone, and I was like, is that them? There's an awful lot of black over there. Um, and it was, in, fa in fact, that meeting. Um, but I was like, hey, you know, I, I really want to see this grow and, like, try to grow a community around it. Can I do that? And they were like, yeah, that'd be awesome. So I started putting, like, flyers on cork boards in colleges and actually, like, literally going to every bookstore and putting a flyer in the copies of 2600 that they had at the bookstores to get people to come out. And in a relatively short amount of time, we had 20 plus 30 people who were all meeting in this food court. And then about a year after that, we had like 60. So we actually had like one of the largest 2,600 meetings in the country. We had mini cons once a month. Uh, we would descend on this food court and eat bad Chinese food and like give talks to each other and all this other stuff. 
2600 started getting really political and they were like telling you who to vote for and weird stuff and like a manual was going off in the editor's notes about all kinds of crazy political stuff and I was like I don't like that at all um, so I, I reached out to, to Dark Tangent to Jeff and said hey what would you think if like DEFCON started doing its own meetings like what if we didn't do 2600 and we did like a DEFCON group that met up um, and we could just base it off of the area code that everybody's in and he's like I like it call Russ Russ Rogers he was like um, he's like the head vampire of like hackers I swear like he like he will like pluck someone out of whatever and like put them into some position and then you know it's awesome he's a good dude but uh but so I called Russ he's out in Colorado Springs we started the first two um, DEF CON groups they ran for a couple of months and then we announced them at the following DEF CON and obviously it spread like wildfire so it was a lot of rambling that's what I do um it's also the founder of 801 Labs, so the hacker space in Salt Lake City um I will get into infosec burnout in a minute but when I <laughs> I burnt out and then I came back into the the community and was like we need a hacker space and so I uh, got together with a couple of friends and we found a, a place we got a thousand square feet in downtown Salt Lake City for a thousand dollars which um, which seemed like a lot of money at the time and and we filled that space up pretty quick but we still had to stay there for about two years and then finally we were like we have to grow or die you know like it was like grow or die grow or die so I started looking around at all these other locations that we could use um, and I came upon an abandoned building uh, <laughs> that was for rent um, they wanted far too much money and I talked them down to a much more reasonable amount of money and they were like oh we don't know and I'm like well you're getting no money right now so I mean you can we'll give you some money and they were like <laughs> you're right <laughs> like okay um, and so it was a uh, um, it, it looks like the 1970s had had thrown up all over it. It was like all wood paneling, and the carpet was terrible. And it, uh, but we're hackers, so we didn't care. Like it's okay if it's ugly. We went in and we knocked down walls. Like literally on day one, moving in day, like people are like loading in like server racks and stuff. And Stumper and myself are sledgehammering walls down in the middle of this office space, um, which was fun. And then like eventually tiring, or like oh. It's, sounded like a lot more fun like in the beginning uh, <laughs> but um, but we've been in that space now for two more years so we've had a hacker space for four years we have a dedicated classroom that holds about 20 people with a projector and you know uh, screens and a way to stream everything that we do onto the internet and to the YouTube channel and stuff like that we have a library where a bunch of people have come in and put in their books we've got uh, a dedicated lock picking and tamper evident room a bunch of solvents and all the different envelopes and crazy crap that you want uh, to mess around with for tamper evident and literally thousands of dollars worth of locks and picks and stuff our lock sport nights are probably one of our most popular events so um, we have a lot of a lot of that stuff a whole hardware hacking room you know and then some of the traditional makerspace stuff we're not a makerspace we're a hacker space we're hackers you know so it's infosec focused so we have a laser cutter and a vinyl cutter and a CNC router and like some tools and other stuff like that. But we also have a server room that's got a full rack of equipment with like professional stuff in there that is a hostile network that people can go and spin up VMs and do malware analysis or whatever it is that they want to do. So um, hacker space. Um, let's see. So I have co-authored three books, um, soon to be four. All soon um, it's a lot of work I, I don't recommend it um, and I've spoken at Black Hat four times DEF CON seven times RSA conference ShmooCon, B-Sides um, Cactus Con like Hack Con out in Norway and stuff like that so I get around I'm kind of a whore uh, so so one of the things people seem to like to hear about is like what it was like in the old and crusty days. So that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit. Um, 
when I was a kid, uh, I, sh- I was going to say when I was a kid, I had ADHD. If you can't tell by my just constant movement, I still have it. Um, so, uh, but I'm hyperactive, you know, uh, constantly driving my family crazy. Um, but my parents got divorced when I was pretty young. My dad moved in with his younger brother, my, my uncle. He's only about 10 years older than me. But he was like this freak of nature because he was into computers. And so this is like, you know, mid to late 80s. Um, so that's not a normal thing. And he had a computer in the house. Um, he was always working on some type of electronics or whatever. And one day I went in to, uh, to his bedroom and he was sitting on the floor and he had a VCR. So for you guys who don't know, that's like we used to put movies on actual magnetic media and then they would run it across this other media and then a picture would show magic. Um, and so he had a VCR open on the floor and he was working on it. And I was like, what are you doing? You know, and he's got all the electronic components and stuff. And he's like, oh, I'm fixing this for somebody. And I was like, oh, cool. What does this do? What does this do? And he was telling me and I was like, what is that? And I reached in to the VCR and I was about to touch the top of a capacitor. Um, and he smacks my hand away and he's like, dude. And he's like, oh, he's like, that would have been bad. And I'm like, like, why? You know, and he's like, that's a capacitor. I was like, what does that do? And he's like, well, it's basically like a little container. It's like an envelope that holds on to electricity and it will hold it no matter what. And I'm like, but it's unplugged. And he's like, yeah, but it can still hold a charge. Um, I was like, <sighs> like, you know, my, my eight year old brain just thought that was the most amazing thing ever. And I was like, well, what's that? You know, and that's a resistor. What's that? That's a capacitor. What does that do? And I became obsessed with electronics at that point. Um, so that was good. That was a, a life-changing moment for me. You know, it's like literally like a, a, almost touching the top of a capacitor um, changed my life. Uh, later, I did a technical electronics class when I was in high school, um, like one of those vocational school type of things. And we used to charge up the capacitors and throw them to each other. Like... By the time that year was over, you could have thrown someone a baby and we would have let it drop on the floor. Like, it was like no one caught a damn thing in that class. Like, it was like you try to come up with new and interesting ways to get somebody to touch the capacitors. Like, you know, it was like, it was ridiculous. Or we'd do dumb crap, like charge up like the one farad caps and like touch them together and it'd like arc. And we're like, yee this is fun. Like, we're idiots. Um... So I was really into video games like most kids were. And my first online experience actually ended up being with a pirate bulletin board system. Uh, and I figured out, like, oh, I can get games. And that's how I actually learned the, like, what a byte was and what a kilobyte was and what a megabyte was and how that related to BOD because I needed to know how long it was going to take me to download something. So it would be like, okay, well, how long is this going to take? Well, that will take you an hour. How long is this going to take? That will take all day. How long is this going to take? Just forget it, you know, <laughs> like that kind of thing. So I hung out on this pirate BBS for probably like three years, but I loved it because I was eight, nine, ten years old, like, and nobody knew how old I was. They were only judging me based off the content of the posts that I put on the BBS. They had no idea that I was a kid. Um, I have no idea if they were kids or if they were adults or whatever. I just knew them based off of some handle, which I was still using Grifter. At like at eight years old, I was using Grifter. Um, and so I loved that. I loved that aspect. When eventually somebody said, hey, like based on my posts and personality, they were like, I think you would like this BBS. Like, and they gave me a number, and it was to a hacker BBS. And I did love it. <laughs> um, and I read everything like every every text file all of it um including all of the like crazy government conspiracy stuff that was like you know like, like the government's working with aliens and i'm like i knew it you know like i knew it um but um but the thing for me was that i only had access to computers on the weekend so it's like again uh, parents are divorced I, I go see my dad on the weekend or like if i at that point when i when i started getting to hacking again 11 years old um, I became obsessed with it, like where any moment that I was not at school, where I didn't have to be at school and I could go to my father's house, which was a you know half hour, 40 minute drive away from my mom's house. So it wasn't like an easy thing to just get there, but I would go and I would sit on the computer. Like I literally would not sleep at all 
sometimes for days, to the point that I would start to hallucinate. Like I'd have hallucinations that like, th like things would be moving in the peripheral, my peripheral vision and like, like that's how I knew I should probably lay down for a couple hours. Or I'd get this like really intense paranoia. Like I remember vividly this one time where I thought, okay, something's on the other side of that door. And I was certain that if I opened the door, I would die. Like it was like that level of crazy. Like I just would not sleep. I just hacked, hacked, hacked like all day. Um, what's awesome about it though, is that like my, because of the ADHD and whatever, they were just happy. Like my dad and my uncle and like, you know, every, the, they were just like, yay, he's not like running around like a crazy person, you know, one kid down. Um, and they would just like, my dad would bring food in and like set it on the desk next to me. And then I would just be like, thanks, you know, and I just keep going. Um, I never got caught. Like I never... Like, never been arrested, never been raided, had friends who had and stuff like that. But I never did, except for by my dad. Like, one time I was doing some um, genuine fraud um, <laughs> where uh, some stuff with credit cards and things. Like, back in the day, we called it carding. Now we call it identity theft. Um, but um, I had a whole bunch of credit cards, up, numbers up on the screen, and he comes in behind me. And I'm like, I have no idea that he's there. And he says, like, what the hell is that? You know, and I'm like... Well, I'm caught, so, and I'm like, it's about 200 credit card numbers. And he's like, why? And I was like, oh, I'm just trying to, you know, figure out the algorithm or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like to, and he was like, just promise me that, like, the FBI is not going to kick in the door. And I was like, okay, I promise, because everybody knew, knows that it was the Secret Service that did that, so I figured I didn't lie. <laughs> like, I didn't lie, like, you know, I mean, it's, he's like, oh, you said the FBI? This is the Secret Service. They are completely different. Um, and so, um, so again, though, like when I was, when I wasn't there, I had no access to a computer. I grew up in a relatively, um, not even relatively, a very poor area of Long Island. Um, you know, single mom, no access to, to a computer, but I did have some pay phones that were on the corner by the deli by my house. So I would go down to the pay phones and I would freak. So I love freaking. So when Michael said yesterday that he was down with freaking, I was like, that's my dog. Um, and if you haven't read Exploding the Phone, it's an incredible book about the history of freaking. Incredible, incredible book. Like about the phone system, basically from its inception to like modern day freaking is incredible. Please read it. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of good stuff out there. That book though, that dude did so much research on it. It's, it's oh, I love it. Um, so, like I said, I'd go to the payphone. I was always, like, trying to call wherever. Obviously, also, it helped because when I was, um, you know, connecting online or trying to call bulletin board systems or other, you know, uh, voice mailbox systems across the country and stuff, you had to figure out how to do that for free. Um, so, you know, I have pictures up here of things like the Radio Shack 33 memory pocket tone dialer and a butt set and an acoustic coupler and all that stuff. But... Um, it's like, it's not bullshit when you watch hackers and you see like serial killer and he like gets up and he goes into the back of the truck and they're like, and he's like, you know, where it comes out wearing a hat and all that stuff. Like if you wanted to learn about the phone system at the time, like you had to go find the manual and where do you find a manual? Well, you find it in the back of a truck for one of the texts, um, like for real. Um, so, <laughs> so this is my, my nine X hard hat. Um, and my butt set. Um, and then there's my manual. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, you like, I know it's like a funny scene where he's like, yo, brain dead, the manual. Like, that's like, you really needed to get the manual. So, um, so that's my service tech handbook where I got to learn a lot of stuff about the phone system. What's funny is that last night I got on, um, Google Maps, and I was like, man, I haven't looked at, like, that central office in forever, this one that was near my house. I'm like, I wonder, um, I wonder if it's still there. Uh, and it is. Can anybody notice anything about that photo? Freaking gates open. They never learn. They never learn. Um, so, so, yeah. And you can see there's some woods next to it. Convenient as hell. All right, um, so 
I'm going to start going through this stuff pretty fast because I, you know, I haven't seen any little pieces of paper come up here. You know, what? put them in the put them in the helmet. I'm telling you, guys are going to feel bad if you don't if you don't put your name in this thing. I promise. I promise. What did you do? You guys are out of control. I didn't. I forgot who I was talking to. Like you were like, no, like it's a bunch of programmers. Unless you like lay out exactly how to, they were like, you said write your name on the paper. There was nothing in there about tearing or whatever. These are instructions that were not included. Um, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. We'll sort it out one way or the other. I'll just I'll do this or something. We'll we'll, we'll sort it out. Um, so anyway. So I, um, like I said, I grew up in New York. I, I, to get out of New York in a, in a bad situation, I, I was not a good kid. Like, besides the hacker stuff, none of my friends knew about the hacker stuff, but I was involved in, like, gang activity, and I, like, used to rob houses and stuff like that. I was just not a good person. <laughs> um, eventually, I decided I wanted to get out, away from that, out of that, that situation, so I went to the military, because that's what you do when you're poor and you don't have money for college and, um, and you want to get out of a crap situation is you, you join some branch of the military. So that's what I did. And I got stationed out in Utah. Um, when I was there, I like I bought a computer. You know, I was living in the dorms on base. I bought a computer. Uh, then I sold the computer <laughs> because apparently I could not own a computer without um, just breaking into all the things, uh, which is not a smart thing to do from a military installation. Just like as a heads up, um, like, uh, and so I was like, well, I really don't want to go to federal prison, so I'm just going to sell the computer. What's funny about that as well is that at the same time I had met my wife. Like, she was, you know, I started dating my wife, but I had gotten rid of the computer. My wife had no idea about the hacker stuff until after we were married. Like, and then it was like, because I got out of the military after we were married. And, and then I was like, so, yeah. It's like, you know, I'm sure, like, if you were, like, in a Harry Potter book and you had to tell someone you were a witch, like, that was my, like, my coming out. Like, I was like, so I break into things. Um but, yeah, so um, so I told you about um, 2600. Eventually, I got to the point where I was, I just avoided the scene for a little while. But I, I got to the point where I was like, I missed it. And, and I was about to get out of the military. So I figured, okay, it's safe for me to go back and have these contacts and stuff. And I really wanted to go to DEF CON that year. And I'd been avoiding DEF CON as well, um, just because I just didn't think it was a smart thing for me to do, um, knowing my tendencies. Um, so... I started going to 2600. I met a bunch of cool people. We grew the meetings. We used to do this road trip out to DEF CON. It was dope. We would like all get in the car and caravan down there together at like some ridiculous hour. Like one year, like when wireless was new, we, we like gathered up all of our Wi Fi equipment, like all of our antennas, and we like taped them to the windows of the cars and we set up an ad hoc wireless network on like on the road trip and then we set up an IRC server and we were like lols to each other like on IRC like driving down I-15 it was ridiculous um and we used to like put this scrolling LED display in the back window and troll the cars behind us in this like we we drove down well at least me and the couple guys I was with we drove down what we called the van of justice um and and we would just troll people and have you know just a really good time so um, I love DEF CON. Like, it's just great. I seriously, like, I, I love it. I've been going for a really long time. And so there, I, I know it's super crowded today, but for me, there is no concept in my brain of ever not going, like, as long as it continues to be there. So I started, I, you know, volunteering, started gooning out of DEF CON. I became the, the admin of the DEF CON forums. So I was, um, was doing administration, me and another guy named Nolltone. Um, and, I was bitching about how expensive Black Hat was, like on the forums. Like it was just like, at that point, I, I had started my own company. I was like, look, I'm like young and whatever. I don't, I don't have thousands of dollars to go to Black Hat. This is crap, you know. So, um, somebody on the forum, Russ Rogers again, head vampire of hackers, um, and he says, oh hey, would you like to volunteer? I can make an introduction for you. So I'm like, okay, yeah, that'd be great. Um, he makes the introduction. I'm supposed to go out for like their U.S. show, the Vegas show. But then like two weeks later, I get an email from one of the organizers, Ping, and she says, hey, one of our guys dropped out. Can you come out to our Seattle show? It's the Windows show. They used to have a Windows, Black Hat Windows show up in Microsoft's backyard. I'm like, 
hell yeah. Like it's like one in the morning. I go wake up my wife. They want me to go to Seattle. Can I go? You know, and she's like, you may go. You know, so so off I went. Um, and I loved it. Had a really great time. Um, and in between that show, and they were like, we'll see you in Vegas. In between that show and the Vegas show, they went off to Amsterdam to the Europe show. And so the guy who does what I do now... Um, he packaged up all the gear for the, for the Amsterdam show, put it on a pallet, got it out on the loading dock, and then left it there and went to Amsterdam, like not having shipped it. Um, so they got to Amsterdam and they had no equipment, no cables, no anything. And it happened to be a holiday weekend. They had to like call and get someone to open up a store just so that they could like actually like put on the con. <laughs> Okay, we're cool now, we're cool. Um, but, but yeah, so, um, so he left all that stuff behind. There was all this, you know, uh, scrambling to put the show on. So obviously, like, he didn't do that anymore. You know? And they called me and they said, we really, really like you. And you were so great to work with out in Seattle. Will you come and do this, like, at the U.S. show? You can bring your own team. We'll pay you. We'll fly you out. We'll do all this stuff like that. And I'm like, this is awesome. Hell yeah, I'll do it. And I brought two friends to run the entire Black Hat Network in Vegas. It was a mistake. Um, now we run the network with 21 industry professionals and 70-plus college students who all deploy equipment, and we work with vendors to do some. Uh, they like donate their equipment and their time and some of their engineers. It's a big undertaking. But at the time, it was me and two guys. Ridiculous. Um, so one of the things, uh, actually, that's, uh, I should put in a little plug for myself. That, that is the first time I got published in 2600. That's the, that's the issue. And I was very like, yay. Um, uh, it was actually about dumpster diving, which is funny. Um, so, but one of the things that came out of doing those things and going out, I am what I term as a high functioning introvert. Um, doing what I'm doing right now is, uh, mentally, uh, exhausting for me. It's difficult. I have to like go in a cave and like recharge after cons and stuff like that. But in this industry, if you're not active and you're not out doing things and meeting people, then you're invisible. So you have to do it. So one time I go down to the bar, and there's a guy there, and he's talking to some other dude, and they're saying, oh, we got a couple going in the hat. This is it's working out. Um, so you can pass the hat around, too, I guess, if people have them. Do you want the hat? Do you want Oh, she's on it. Um, so, so I hear these two guys talking about a book, and so I just walk up, and I'm like, that book sucks. Um, and he's like, why? You know? And I was like, because of this and this and this. And he's like, well, have you ever read this book? I was like, yeah, that book's okay. And he's like, why? And I'm like, because of this and this. He's like, what about this? I'm like, that sucks too. Um, and I just talked to these guys about books, which I love. Like, I read constantly. I think that's a trait we all share as hackers is we just constantly reading stuff. So after about 45 minutes to an hour of talking to these guys, like, I'm like, okay, I'm going to, like, go wander around or whatever. It's nice to meet you guys. And the dude's like, oh, here's my card. And he hands me his card, and it's the, um, the VP of the um, publishing company who I was just eviscerating for the last hour. <laughs> like, so I'm like, and I'm like, oh! I was like, oh. And he's like, ah, you know, like, gotcha. Um, and I was like, he's like, it's totally okay, actually. Like, can I just get your address, and I'm just going to send you every security book we put out, and you tell me what you think. Um, and I was like, hell yeah, free books. Um, and so I started getting books and we like there a relationship grew there where I would tell him like, hey, this this is really like a hot topic right now. Maybe you should do a book on it. And like six months later, like a book or nine months later, a book would come out on that topic. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Like I'm like having an effect on what's going out from this company. Um, and then one time I was like, you should do a book about this. And he was like, yeah, we should do a book about that. And I'm like, what do you mean we? You know? And he's like, I've been giving you free books for like three years. It's about time you made me some money. <laughs> like I was like, oh, that's fair. Um, so, um, so I work with them. That's how I ended up doing um, my first book. And then, like I said, I've done um, two more since then, so three total. Um, but I just did what, what everybody does, I think, which is I keep going to Black Hat, and I keep going to DEF CON, and I keep playing with tools. Um, I build a home lab, I'm hacking away, I'm doing my stuff, 
Um, I start my own company when I get out of the military because, honestly, um, I, I didn't know what else to do. I, I did F-16 avionics when I was in, and I didn't want to work on jets for the rest of my life. So somebody was like, well, what can you do? And I was like, I am breaking the computers. Um, and they were like, well, like you can do that. And then people will pay you to tell you how, like tell them how you did it and whatever. And I was like, well, sign me up for that shit. Like, and so, um, but being in Utah, it's not really a, um, very, at the time, at least it wasn't security forward. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to say it other than there weren't security companies based in Utah or people or companies even having a presence there. So I started my own thing and I started doing consulting and uh, pen testing and, you know, uh, vulnerability assessments, that kind of stuff. I did a little bit of IR work as well, just because people say, oh, well, if you could break in this, I know these people, they just got broken into. Maybe you can tell them how they did it and like help them get their head right, you know, whatever. So I did that. Um, then I went to work for Juniper. I was there for like six years doing security stuff with them. Again, doing all this stuff, DEF CON stuff, Black Hat stuff, all the blah, 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 all, all these meetings. And then I finally, I was just like, I burnt out. Like, I completely burnt out. Um, that is, that's a, that happens. I know Michael mentioned it more than once yesterday in his keynote. He said, like, you know, that security burnout, like having the degree just in case you're like, I mean, frankly, just like, fuck this. And then you like go off and do something else because that's what, um, that's what happens. And so that's what happened to me. Like, I was just like, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. I'll do it as a hobby at night, but it's no longer fun for me during the day. And so I went off and did um, something completely outside of my, my comfort zone. After about three years of doing that, I decided, like, I, I wanted to go back to security because everything else sucks. Um, and so I came back home. Uh, that's when I decided to start the hacker space um, that we talked about. Um, and so, but now I'm back. Now I'm going back into this industry that I walked away from for a couple of years. Um, so what am I going to do? Well, we can't have a talk without talking about red versus blue. Um, so let's do it. So red team stuff. So red team's awesome, right? Red team, super sexy. Like just ninjas rolling around like pew, pow, exploit, pew, exploit. Like, you know, it. It's very satisfying. Popping a shell on a box is satisfying every time. It's as satisfying if any of you have spent any time picking locks in there. Um, when you pick a lock and the and it pops open or the you know the cylinder turns, like there is like there is satisfaction in that that never dulls. Like it's like that that clink as a padlock opens. You're like all padlocks are mine. Like, you know, there's like this, like, and so the same thing happens when you, like, you know, you pop calc or pop a shell or something, you're like, all computers are mine. Like, it, it feels good. So that's fine. You just, you know, you keep doing that. But what does it really help? You know, like, what are you helping when, you, when you're doing that kind of thing? Um, and I'm not trying to say that, like, red teaming is bad. Obviously, I, I, I did it for years. Um, I actually think it's an incredible skill set, and it's a skill set that defenders need as well. Um, but... Uh, to my to my earlier point, you know about like when I got out, the, it was I did it because it was the only thing I knew how to do, and I kept doing it and kept doing it, and then, I mean, I, I think again, Michael, you mentioned this yesterday. Like, what is the what are the odds if the scope is open? What are the odds of somebody getting in on an engagement? Like, hundred percent, a hundred percent. So you know that if you're going into this environment. And the scope is open, not like where they're like, oh, you can't do it during these hours, and you can't do it to these systems, and you can't do whatever, and you're like, look, like, are we going to do this? Or like, why don't you just pay me, and we'll check that box together, and I'll go home, because I got kids. Like, so, um, but if the scope is open, you should get in. Like, every time, you should get in some way. You should have some type of deliverable for the client. Um, and if you don't, if you're not getting in or you find yourself like hitting a wall, like then maybe that's not for you. Maybe it's maybe hang it up. Like um, red teaming isn't for everyone. The thing is, everybody thinks red teaming is for them. So they're like, no, no, I'm I'm a hacker for hire. Pew, pow. Like that's what I do. Like and it's like just because you use Metasploit once doesn't make you a, a you know a red teamer. So um, but. It's true. That's the it's the unfortunate reality of the industry. Real, 
real pen testers, real red teams, um, they write reports. They come back to you with actionable data afterwards. They say, yeah, you failed, and that's okay because at least now we know this, 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 and this, and I can help you make sure that the next time we come at you, next quarter or whatever, um, these things should be taken care of. If they're seeing the same things, that's where you're failing. But they should be coming in and be, it should be getting more and more difficult. The bar needs to be raised. Um, the thing is, those type of pen testers, they're super rare. Like, super rare. Everybody says, oh, I do pen testing. It's like, no, like, you can't just, like, you know, like, run some scanner and then be like, oh, yeah, I'm a pen tester. I'm going to charge you a lot of money for that. Um, but again, I felt like after a while, it was like, oh, I'm, like, I always succeed. So, great. Like, now what? Do I just keep doing that? Um, so I did. So I went to the blue team. Blue team? Yep, yep. We're Smurfs. <laughs> That's right. Um, the thing is, so on the blue team side of the house, we need highly skilled red teamers. We need people with that skill set. Like I said, what I do is I do threat hunting. So my job is to find the attacker and find those indicators of compromise in a network that you don't know is already owned. So it's basically, there's a lot of fancy definitions for threat hunting. It's a fabulous buzzword people are throwing around. It's just doing IR when you don't know that you're owned. Like, so I go in and try to find the things that would stand out, the trail that somebody would leave behind. Um, you know, so it's uh, having the ability to say, I know what this you know, exploit looks like on the wire, or I know what DLLs are getting, you know, hooking, and I know what processes it's spawning, and I know, you know, what, you know, like if you get in there and like, you know, PowerShell is connecting to the internet, like it's like, take a look. Um, so, there, like knowing what you would do as a red teamer makes you an incredibly effective blue team uh, person. And the thing is, like, again, I know that the red team thing is sexy and everybody's like, what do you do for a living? And you're like, I break into computers for money. And that sounds really cool. But yeah, <laughs> that's fair. We do kick them out. So if you really, really want to test your skills, like go up against all those red teamers. If you think like, okay, I'm getting to the point where I'm just always getting in and this is getting stale. See if see if you're good enough. Like, go up against the guys and gals on your team. Like, see if you can keep them out. Um, and odds are you can't. But how long can you keep them out and how quickly can you detect them once they're inside? Um, let's see. Um, it's kind of, like, that's the thing about, like, again, about the red team stuff, is it just sounds sexy. Um, but there actually, like, there is the new sexy, um, which is threat hunting. So w what I do is very buzzwordy and stuff right now, but damn, it's fun. Um, so that, th that girl up there, her name is Teresa Vale. She is Miss Kansas 2013 and then like a finalist in Miss USA. They wouldn't let her do archery on stage because they said no projectiles or whatever, but that's America right there. Um, <laughs> But she's like a legitimate like badass hunter, like like killing animals and stuff, which is not my thing. Like, but that is. Um, <laughs> so, um, she's like, what's that? Somebody shouted something. So, um, so again, so the, your your job as a hunter is to take those red team skills, find out what's going on. If you are a red teamer right now, at least just run Wireshark. Like, see what's happening on the wire while you're doing those attacks. See what you're affecting on those machines. Um, again, Michael said it yesterday, log, 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 log. Read your freaking logs. Like, if, if you don't read your logs, like, you're a fool. The RSA breach, I work for RSA, the RSA breach back in 2011 was found because a Windows administrator looked at their logs and said, this looks weird, and told the CERC, this looks weird. And that's how that the discovery of that breach like came to be was somebody just went that looks weird in the logs so look in the logs cliff stole the cuckoo's egg like 25 cent discrepancy 
in the logs on processing time at the time of the university. And, you know, spoiler alert, it's right there on the cover. Um, tracking a spy through the maze of computer espionage leads to finding a German spy who's trying to grab all this stuff off of military systems. Um, the thing is, these are about finding little things, finding little anomalies. So, you know, you got the super troopers thing where the one shot is up in the neck and he's got the rest of the grouping of the chest. And he's like, what about that little guy? And he's like, I wouldn't worry about that little guy. That little guy is the one that you want to look for. That's the one you want to go after. Um, I also put up from hackers the Ellingson Mineral Corporation where he says God wouldn't be up this late. Being a threat hunter means knowing when your key users are going to be online and when they're not, what systems they should be accessing and what they shouldn't knowing your ingress and egress points. I'm crazy, like I'm crazy paranoid. Um, I go into a room and I'm immediately checking all of the exits. I'm thinking about, okay, if this turns into an active shooter situation, where, how do I get out of here? Um, I know that there's an exit there and there, but I'm in a restaurant, so there's probably an exit out of the back the kitchen staff can use, so that's another exit other people aren't thinking about. Are these chairs bolted down? Because if shit goes down, I'm going to take this chair and hurl it through the window, and that's another exit. Like, what's that guy looking around so much for? Maybe he's just like me and paranoid, or maybe he's about to start something. So I'm, uh, that's how I roll. Like, Crazy, you know, situational awareness. Always looking for the anomaly in things, which turns out is a good skill to have uh, to be a threat hunter. So if you're the, that kind of mentality, if you're the person who always notices things when they seem off a little, then you're you're the person. That's the right skill set. That's the right fit. So do that. Um, even this, like my pen, is a Smith and Wesson pen. I take this on planes. Like you know, I sit it in the seat in front of me. If some if something kicks off, I'm gonna jab this in someone. TSA lets you fly with this. I've been flying with this for years. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, like, I, in situations, there's going to be people who live and people who die. I'm going to live. Like, that's it. Like, so, um, but yeah, like, have that paranoia. The thing is, we live in a, a, an industry and a society where, um, there are hundreds and hundreds of vendors. Like, if you go to RSA conference, they have two expo halls you could land a jumbo jet in. Like, it's ridiculous. There are hundreds. They're like, they brag about it. They're like, we have 700 vendors, you know? And it's like, cool. Like, 690 of those are snake oil. Um, so the thing is, it's like, I, I put this up here because both of these, like, you know, we hate vendors, right? Like, boo vendors. I work for a vendor. Boo me. Um, but that's a bow. And that's a bow. But they're drastically different. So there are people out there who are making tools that are good for the job. So find out who those companies are and make, make sure you, you do your research so that you know you're using the right thing out in the field. Because it can make your job a lot easier. But just don't end up in a trap where you end up buying some garbage. Um, all right. So again, this is just I'm, just, I'm a rambler. You guys are just getting ramblings. Um, so here's my thing. We love to play the shame game. Like, why is that? Like, if you notice, anytime there's a breach, everybody goes like this. Oh, wait, how did they get in? They're doing what? They're using what exploit? And they look around like, are we patched? Are we patched? We're patched? We're patched? Okay, we're good. Oh, yeah. And they get on Twitter and a bunch of armchair CISOs are like, they should have done this and they should have done this. What amateurs. Like, it's just absurd. Like, it's like the first thing you think to do is just go, we're good? Good, because now I want to go shame whoever that company is. Um, I, like, I, I call it the security scarlet letter because... You like, you, if you're breached, people make you like walk around like the con circuit for years, like going like, yes, I worked at Target during the breach. Yes, I did. I was there. I went to work for RSA years after the RSA breach. People gave me shit about it when I got hired. I was like, you know, I wasn't there, right? Like I wasn't, it was like, it was years before I got there. Like it didn't matter. People were like, oh, RSA, huh? <laughs> you guys know what it's like to get breached. What do you want me to do, bruh? So, um, so yeah. But the thing is, because of that mentality, because we do that, we don't share. So when we have a breach or we have something, we hide. And if we don't have to report it, then we don't. The thing is, the RSA breach, they didn't have to report that. No customer data was taken. So legally, there was no reason that they had to say, like, oh, you have to give this up. 
Like, they didn't have to do it. I'm not stopping in five minutes. I didn't start until 15 after. She's waving a five-minute sign at me. I, I came to speak. I flew from Salt Lake City. Um, so, yeah, so the thing is, we have to share, like, what happened. We have to be able to say, like, oh, look, this is what happened to us. These are the mistakes that we made. This is what you need to do to make sure that you guys don't end up in the same situation as us. Instead of shaming each other and making the other person wear that security scarlet letter, just have the decency to say, what happened? What can, what, what can I do to make sure I don't end up in the same situation? Um, and then find out so you can protect yourself. I was at um, ShmooCon last year, and they had this panel of all these educators up there. And one of the guys on the panel says, oh, yeah, the security, like these are like people who are teaching in universities right now current network security courses and security, secure development and stuff like that. And he's, I don't understand why the security industry is like the one industry where you can just fail over and over and you get a pass. And I was like, yeah, exactly. What? Like, and I literally, because I'm an ass, I like jump up and I scream at the, at the stage. And I'm like, blaming security professionals for, for security issues is like blaming the firefighter for the fire. It's like education happens. There are smoke detectors. There are classes to say, like, to, for kids in school to teach them to stop, drop, and roll and do all those things or whatever. But when a fire truck drives down the street, we don't look at it and say, <laughs> wish those guys did a better job. Firefighters are really failing us. Fires are going to happen. It's going to happen. It's not our fault that developers suck. No, that's not what, that's not what I meant to say. What I meant to say was that what I meant to say was that it doesn't matter how many times you say it, some redneck is going to deep fry a turkey in his garage. Tell him no. Tell him no all you want. Now, to be fair, I deep fry a turkey every Thanksgiving out in the middle of my lawn, but not in my garage. But that's not the firefighter's fault if that goes down. So it's... Uh, what, what I think we can do is learn from the airline industry. So the airline industry shares data. Um, they found out years ago, um, actually, I, I want to say it's in, maybe it's in Freakonomics or something like that. They talk a lot about the airline industry and things that they learned by sharing information with one another. And one of the most common reasons for a plane crash is when a co-pilot and a pilot don't know each other. And the reason for that is because the co-pilot feels like he cannot question the senior officer. Is it Malcolm Gladwell? Which one, which one was it? Which book? Is it Outliers? It's one, one of those. Okay. So, so, that's, they, so they find out, okay, that's because they can't, they're not talking to each other. Um, and this guy feels like he can't question because he doesn't know the other dude. And so he's just like, well, that's the senior guy. I'll just keep my mouth shut and I'll do whatever. Instead of saying, like, maybe you shouldn't pull that lever. Um, <laughs> and so... We can take a, a little a tip from that. Instead of having our level one analyst not be able to question a level three analyst and say, hey, I think that there's a problem here. And the level three guy goes, no, nah, no, nah, it's fine. No, I really think we have a problem. Like that level of communication, that pulling off, like as Michael stated yesterday, removing rank. Like that's one of the things that makes people satisfied in a position like being able to say, we're all equals here. Like people handle different incidents at different levels or whatever. But if you believe there's a problem in an organization, you have to say something. And if, if people won't listen to you, you make them listen. Um, there, was a, there was an incident, and I guess you know, the, all this data comes from like flight recorders and all this stuff, where a, um, a plane had an engine on fire. The pilot says... The right engine is on fire. We're going to turn it off. Everybody looks out. The right engine's fine. The left engine's on fire. But they're like, hey, he probably just misspoke. No one says a word. He shuts off the good engine, and the plane crashes. Holy crap. Like, no one was just like, dude, your other left. Like, you know, like, just like something. Um, 
no one said anything. People died, like hundreds of people died because no one would just say like, hey man, are you sure? You have to be able to have that kind of communication. Um, and another thing that the airline industry does that I think we can take a clue from is not punishing mistakes. If somebody does something wrong, they write up a report and they share it with everybody. And you don't get like penalized because of it. If you turn onto the wrong runway, they say, well, what happened there? And they're like, oh, well, normally we all stay at this hotel, but there were a bunch of hackers there, so it was sold out. So we had to go to a hotel down the street, and the pilot was uh, allergic to the soap that was in the sheets or whatever, and so he was really tired because he didn't get a lot of sleep, and so he turned on the wrong one r- runway. And they write it all up, and they're like, okay, make sure to stay at the hotels, blah, 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 blah. They, they try to figure out the ways to keep things standard so they don't have problems like that. Um, and, and we can do those things too. You know, if we are willing to just like put our hand up and go, I made a mistake rather than being like, oh crap, I made a mistake. Now everybody in the office is going to shame me and it's probably going to end up on social media and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, let's, uh, let's stop doing that. Um, so let's talk about threat intel for a second. So Somewhere along the way, we, we thought that it was cool to like charge money for threat intel. And like every company does it. It drives me freaking crazy. Like charging for, for threat intel is an absurd concept. This is, this is the data that will keep you safe. These are the indicators that you have to look for in your network or, you know, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that different threat actor groups are using that will help you make sure that your network and your users are protected. But somebody was like, well, yeah, I got all this information. What do you want to do with it? And they're like, sell it, baby. Sell it. Some, you know, some sales dude, some sales douche. Um, that was like, we can sell that. We can sell that. Charging for threat intelligence is like if they put out an Amber alert and they were like, Hey, there's a, there's a person going around trying to kidnap children. If you'd like to know what vehicle they're driving, what they look like, whatever, please pay $2.99 and we will send that to you. We would lose our damn minds. That's what this is. That's what charging for threat intel is. It's saying there's an attacker out there. There's a group of highly sophisticated attackers that come from a state-sponsored agency. We know what tools they're using. We've got some information about the way they conduct their campaigns. But you can't have it unless you give me some money. That's called extortion. Um, so um, one of the things I, I put it up here was, again, this is another thing. We need to share, 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 share. But homemade food versus fast food. Create your own threat intel as well. Go out there, get intel from other sources, but your own Threat intel is the most valuable threat intelligence that you're going to get. So if you don't have a program in your organization, start working on one. You have to do those things. Otherwise, um, you're just eating threat intel fast food. Like a bunch of hashes coming over or you know, host names and IP addresses. Like that's garbage. You need TTPs. Um, so this one sometimes pisses people off. Don't care. Um, bug bounties suck. And here's why. Because bug bounties are crowdsourced security for someone who doesn't want to pay for more staff. That's it. That's what it is. What they do is they use your skill set to go out and find the bugs that their developers put into code, and then they give you a token, sometimes a t-shirt. Sweet. That's a nice shirt. Um, But even if they give you 10 grand, 10 grand is nothing. It seems like a, a lot of money when you're starting out in your career, but I promise you, If you want to make more money, if you want to have a career in information security, you take that vulnerability, you do responsible disclosure, then you write up a talk and you put it in a CFP and you send it to uh, any conference, wherever, all over the country, and you present on it and you end up like making yourself a career instead of a boat payment. Um, I know personally, I know of a good friend of mine, he got a $75,000 payout from a company where they said, is like, obviously this is a pretty good bug, and they were like, you cannot talk about it. That's it. They put them under NDA. If you're doing any bug bounty program that tells you you can't talk about it, that's not the one you want to be involved in. All right, I'm going to go quicker. Got like three slides left. Um, so we have a data problem. The problem is we use old systems and we never change them. Look, there's that Social Security card we were talking about earlier. Um, we need to make this data worthless. 
so that if an attacker gets it, it means nothing. We have credit cards, and credit cards are old. You know, we're using this 50-year-old technology with the magnetic stripe on the back. Now we put chips on them, and then we hobbled ourselves with the chip because we don't even use chip and pin. We use chip and signature. And then you get online, and it doesn't matter. I can order some from Amazon. I just put in the number. It doesn't make me put the chip in anything. So what does it matter? And the reason I put a former two-factor uh, authentication up there is because that would solve it. Sure, take all my credit card numbers. You can have them all because when I do a financial transaction, my credit card has a little display on it that every 30 seconds gives me another number, and I put that number in, and unless it matches at that time, the purchase doesn't go through. Well, why, why don't we do that? Because it would cost the credit card companies money. That's why. Um, but that's, that's what it comes down to. If you have two-factor financial transactions, you know, no money, no problems. Um, so now... In closing, some predictions and advice. Uh, things are going to get worse before they get better. Like, that's just how it is. Um, we are in an unbelievable talent vacuum. We need people sharpening their skills, getting out there, and doing the jobs that, um, that are out there and available, and they will pay you, and they'll pay you a lot of money to do them. Um, ransomware is also going to get worse before it gets better. It's, 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 I, I honestly, like, this is a big media, like, ooh, about this last wanna cry, but it's, it's not really that great. Um, it didn't make them a lot of money either. Now everyone's watching those three wallets, like, so close, they'll never get that 70K they got in there. Um, but another thing, stop deleting stuff. Log data and metadata is really cheap to store. Storage is cheap. It's okay to have a security data warehouse where you keep all of those things. And if you're not doing full packet capture, start doing that now. When I'm doing threat hunting, I take the logs, I look at it, I find an anomaly, and then I pivot to a full packet capture, I rebuild the session, I pull binaries out of that session, I throw them in sandboxes, I see what they do. If I find out it's actually something bad, then I pivot to the endpoint, I look at the processes, I do whatever. You have to have that data. Having logs without having full packet capture is like having a surveillance system where you know that you RFID, you slap your card up against the reader when you go in and it says, oh yeah, Grifter came in at eight o'clock this morning. But you don't know it's actually me unless you look on a video screen and say, yes, that's actually Grifter who's going in there, which is what full packet capture gives you. And I know it's expensive and it's a lot of data, but think about it like you do physical video surveillance. Decide how long you're gonna retain it, do whatever, but get it in your environment. Um, Cyber insurance is a thing. Jake from State Farm says so. Um, and I honestly believe that it will change security in the same way it changed the auto industry. They're tying money to this. And insurance companies have an awful lot of money, and they're underwriting all these businesses with data that they don't understand. And eventually they will understand it, and they're going to start forcing companies to say, you have to meet these requirements, you have to do these things, and if you use those vendors then we are gonna charge you more because we know they don't use secure development processes and things like that. So the insurance thing seems hokey and whatever, but I honestly think in the end it will do some good. And lastly, um, it's time to stop being purely defensive. The first book I ever wrote was in 2005, it was called Aggressive Network Self-Defense, and it was about like offensive security, about striking back, about doing stuff. If you haven't played with the ADHD, um, uh, distro, that's a good distro for offensive security stuff, go get it. But if I told you defend yourself, <laughs> yeah, so he's holding up uh, John Strand and Paul Asadorian's book there. Um, but if I say defend yourself, does that mean you just passively sit there and block me while I'm attacking you? Or do you eventually try to kick my ass? It's time to stop just blocking like this and time to kick some ass. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was an awesome keynote.